uh, Ron Howard. Mm -hmm. Does he have a girlfriend? I don't believe so. For 54 million? <laughs> he's gonna have a bunch of girlfriends. He is gonna have a bunch you know of what girlfriends. I mean? You think he'll produce though? <laughs> well, will he, will he, do, will he strike out as many times as he did last year? Oh yeah. You know? Yeah. Will he produce the home runs for the Phillies? I don't, I don't think Ryan now really cares what he produces at this point. Yeah, 54 million. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, do you think the Phillies will get back in there? They talking about a repeat of last year's performance. I, I like to think so. Yeah. yeah. More yet for the Philly pitcher, he was pretty good. I mean, 48 out lights of 48. Out, lights out Lidge, I think. Yeah. You know, oh, he's, yeah, yeah. He's he, one yeah. you want to hold on to. Yeah, 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 yeah. Lights out. Yeah, you know? definitely right. perform. Oh, yeah. He had a 48 saves, 100%. Oh, yeah. Outstanding Incredible. stats. Yeah. Outstanding. Incredible. I don't know how he slept on that one. You know? <laughs> yeah. Did you see the newsman talking about Justin Timberlake and uh, Beyonce? Mm -hmm. You know, um, I thought it was very critical of them performance. I thought the performance was outstanding oh, yeah. at the Emmys, you know. Oh, yeah. Uh, you know, Justin Timberlake is okay. He, you know. I, he could dance. Oh, yeah, and plus that one that he did with the... Uh, <coughs> uh, 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 you guys are supposed to talk about the same thing. All right. Oh, the, the Phillies? All right. Okay. No, it has, to, it has to be basically the same as the Okay, well, Pat Burrell. Mm -hmm. Do you think the Phillies will repeat without Pat Burrell? Because they got rid of Pat Burrell, so the team is not 100%. Well, you know, if they want to repeat, they're supposed to keep the same integrity that they right. had last year, right. and they should keep the same team. Mm -hmm. You know, Pat Burrell did come through with some tight squeezes. Oh, yeah. But Uli Utley, mm -hmm. I always get his name, yeah. Utley. I think Utley is a dynamite baseball oh, yeah. player. He'd be thinking. Mm -hmm. I've seen him do some nice moves that where you have to be really thinking. Yeah, he's, he's a very professional baseball player. I think he's the... The rock of the team. Yeah. He holds the team together, yeah. and you can see that, you know, with the double plays, uh, the thinking, uh, uh, which out, to, which person that you put out first, and, you know. So he's a, he's definitely a Victorino. You think he'll mm -hmm. perform as good as he did last year? I think so. He's pretty fast. Yeah, Victorino. and uh, you know, mm -hmm. he he's uh, you know he 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 can get under a ball when he yeah. needs to. I did. I like the one where he did the Willie Mays catch out oh, in center yeah. field. You know yeah. where he. Uh, did the really climb the wall <laughs> and got that out, yep, yep. which would have been a home run. Right. That was definitely an outstanding oh, play yeah, there. Outstanding. You know, he did a Spider-Man on him. <laughs> yeah. I thought yep, he did. I yep. thought he really did excellent Spider-Man. The catcher's outstanding too. They have a, Phillies have a good pit catcher. Yeah. Now the shortstop, he made a lot of errors. Yeah. He did for a shortstop. Shortstop's not supposed to make errors right. like that. You know, I played right. professional. I ain't played professional baseball, but I played hardball. I, I played center field. Yeah. You know, and, and right field. You know, so. Only left-hand hitters came out to my way, yeah. so I didn't. I didn't have too much. All I did was stay, try to yeah. stay awake. <laughs> yeah, picking days. Yeah, 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 <laughs> yeah. But um, I thought the shortstop made a lot of errors. Yeah. I did. If, if I think they would have did a lot better yeah. if he hadn't did so many errors. But they won. Yeah. 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 Do we have? Check. Do we want both? How's that sound? I'm only getting one here, and you're only getting one channel on here, too. Well, check and see, see if they're set. Should uh, no, the boom is not on. Now the boom is on. Are you getting static now? The boom is on. No, so that's good. I want to turn up the volume on the boom. Yeah. Keep talking. Okay, we're testing. We have found it. Okay, do it one more. Do, yeah, do two more takes. Yeah. And get louder each time. Go ahead. Yes. We have found it. Just, we have found. What have we found, Hank? We have found it. What? Doritos. <laughs> Rolling. Are you ready? Rolling. It's the one we've been waiting for. Oh my God. It's the one we've been waiting for. What have we been waiting for? Doritos. <laughs> That's way too loud. <laughs> Do it one more time, not so loud. Okay. It's the one we've been waiting for. It's the one we've been waiting for. Rolling. Feast your eyes on the one and only Doritos. Rolling. Feast your eyes on the one and only Doritos.
Should I turn or just like just oh, eat. Uh, eat? Yeah, he's not a monster. Just to That's it right there. Is it? That that's it right there, right? Yep. That was like, oh. Do it again, do it again. Elmer's just like, what, what do I do now? <laughs> was that it? Yeah, I mean, we got that one sword. Awesome. Yeah. You can just put them there, cool. Alright, so. Thank <laughs> you. 
Okay, let's get back to beer again. This will be a little bit about the, the history of beer. Beer is as old as civilization itself. There are some records to indicate, not records, okay. Beer is as old as civilization itself. There is evidence to indicate that beer was brewed 10,000 years BC. The oldest known recorded recipe is right here in Philadelphia. In fact, it's at the University of Pennsylvania Museum of Archaeology and Anthropology. It was called the, the Hymn to Ninkasi. Ninkasi is the, was the ancient goddess. Ah, oh, Jesus. <laughs> All right, let's start over. Yep. <laughs> beer is as old as civilization itself. In fact, Jesus, All right. One, two, three. beer is as old as civilization itself. Many anthropologists feel that people banded together to settle, to grow grains, to produce beer. The initial, and I'm just not flowing with this. One, two, three. They, they would be 12,000 years old. If it was 10,000 BC, and we would probably that old. Say 10, BC, say, beer, beer, beer. Evident, you're still rolling? Okay. <laughs> beer is as old as civilization itself. There's evidence to indicate that beer has been around for 12,000 years. In fact, many anthropologists believe that the humans initially settled to grow grains to produce beer. The oldest written recipe that's known is right here in Philadelphia at the University of Pennsylvania Museum of Archaeology and Anthropology. It was translated by Professor Solomon Katz, and it's called the Hymn to Nenkasi. And Nenkasi was the ancient Sumerian goddess of beer. And this recipe gives very good details. It has the ingredients, the brewing process, and even how to, down to how to filter the beer. It's very, very technically sophisticated for, for the times. They brewed the beer with grains, dates, honey, aromatics, and bapir, which is a rudimentary form of beer. Now the aromatics would be spices, the dates and the, and the honey would be used for sugar for the fermenta, fermenta, fermentation process to create both the alcohol and the carbonation in the beer. Since we're speaking, okay. Go back to the honey. Is that rolling? Is rolling? It even gives the ingredients of the beer. It, it has dates, honey, grains, aromatics, and bapir. And bapir is a rudimentary form of bread. Now they would use the dates and the honey to provide the fermentable sugars for the yeast to convert into alcohol. The aromatics would be the spices, the indigenous spices to the area. And it was a very detailed, technically correct recipe, all the way down to the filtration process. Again, that's at the University of Pennsylvania Museum on display at all times. Now women have always been part of the brewing process. In ancient Babylon, they were elevated to the rank of priestess for their ability to create this magic elixir. In some cultures, they were reviled as witches. So it depends where you live, whether it was, beer was a good thing or a bad thing. And to this day, we had prohibition in this country, so it depends on your culture at the time. Today, unfortunately, women are relegated to adornments to beer commercials to help sell mass-produced beer. There are very few women involved in the brewing process today. Okay. Okay. Hold on. Hold on. <clears throat> beer 101, history of beer, take three. By 500 AD, beer was being brewed throughout Europe. And this is a result of the conquest of the Roman armies. Many of the soldiers were paid, part of their pay included a ration of beer, a daily ration of beer. 
so the Romans need it with all their con. Okay. Beer was being brewed throughout Europe by 500 AD. This is a result of the Roman conquest and the Roman armies. Many of the Roman soldiers were paid, as part of their pay package, was a ration of beer. And this is true throughout history, that the soldiers travel by their stomach and by their, eh, that's just embellishing too much, sorry. Take it easy, whatever. Yeah, yeah. Got plenty of tape. Yeah. All right. Beer. Do you want to do it? Okay. By 500 AD, beer was brewed widely in Europe. And this is a direct result of the Roman army's travels. The armies paid their soldiers a ration of beer every day as part of their pay package. Now, this developed in all these different countries and towns and villages that the Romans conquered. Eventually, it went from family brewing to town brewing, and eventually went to monasteries and convents. Now, the monastery specialized in brewing beer as a welcoming to the traveling pilgrims. Now, two things happened to revolutionize beer. One was the discovery of hops. Okay, now we we'll start with that second. Okay. One, yes, sir. Two things. Okay. Two things revolutionized the processing of. You're doing great, Tom. Two things happened to standardize the modern brewing process. One, they started adding hops to beer back in around the 1100s in both Germany and Belgium. Hops acted for two ways. One, it was the seasoning for the beer, it added a bitterness to it, which helped balance the sweetness of the malted barley. And the second thing it acted as a preservative, so the beer would last longer. <clears throat> the second occurrence that happened was Louis Pasteur discovered that yeast was a living organism. And brewers realized by manipulating the yeast, they can control exactly. <coughs> Sorry. Give me one second. Sorry. Well, so history of beer, beer 101. Take four Tom Peters. Two things happened to revolutionize the process of making beer. First, back in the 1100s, in Belgium and Germany, they began using hops as the aromatics in beer. The hops did two things. It provided bitterness, which helped balance the sweetness of the beer. It had also... I'm talking to him, I see Anything that says veggies. What's that? Anything that he says. Yeah, well, <laughs> sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> it gets distracted. Okay. No, I'm cool. I can just go right there. Just get in the right place. That's right. Okay. Okay. Two things happened to revolutionize the process of modern brewing. The first was in around the 1100s, in both Germany and Belgium, they began using hops to flavor their beers. And this did two things also. It, it, provided a bitterness, which helped balance the sweetness of the malted barley. And secondly, it acted as a preservative, which helped allow brewers to brew beer and ship it further destinations. The second very important thing that happened is that Louis Pasteur discovered that yeast was a living organism. And brewers soon discovered by manipulating the yeast, they can control exactly how the beer ferments, how the sugars turn to alcohol and into carbonation. <coughs> okay, that's. <coughs> Is that the end of this? Yeah, that's segment. Okay. okay. What's that? That's from Lynn. That's how the Blackies learned to sing. That's from Lynn. Take four history. And then modern beer making was born. <laughs> All right, cut. The degree of roasting affects the color of the beer, plus the flavor of the beer. And the amount of malt added to the, the beer will, will also. <clears throat> Basic ingredients are malted grains, water, hops, and yeast. Today, barley is the most common grain used in brewing. 
body fluids, sugar. Starch to sugar rather quickly. And these sugars are necessary to increase both the alcohol and the carbonation. <coughs> Yeah, well, you, you fumble over the words, otherwise there's yeah. some technical stuff. Yeah, take a few minutes. <coughs> Hops, yeast, and water. The grain we use today is malted barley. The barley converts from starch to sugars rather quickly. Barley malt converts starch to sugars rather quickly. Hey, Mr. Come on by. How's it going? Good. Hey, Fergus. What's up, babe? The ingredients <laughs> the process. We're not around to the drinking it yet. Probably well, I am. The drinking it? <laughs> I'm already ahead of that curve. <laughs> Today is barley. Barley is the most common grain used in brewing. Barley fruits, starch, trying to clear malted grains, hops, yeast, and water. Malted barley is the grain of. Today we use malted. I'll just use barley. Everybody knows Fergie. <laughs> He remembers everyone's name. He's well, they asked me, oh, are you my mom? Tell us Fergie. I'm like, I haven't met him. Every morning he realizes when you remember people's names, they're impressed. Yeah, no matter. Yeah, it's just hard to remember. Some people, that's, yeah, I mean, that's a skill. I mean, he, he has an uncanny yeah. skill right there. Uh, more than, uh, yeah. I know what people drink. Don't know what their names are. You know? <laughs> Why, well, it's Fox. He's, that's terrible. <laughs> Water. Yeah, just give me one second. I need to run through this. The call and carbonation present in the beer. The Would you like us to ask you what's involved and then that'll give you a clue? Well, it's just. Uh, the Tom, uh, tell me, uh, how's body in it? Tom Peters, Beer 101. <laughs> Your ingredients. <coughs> Take one. Beer, sorry. <laughs> Beer is made from four basic ingredients. It's made it from malt of barley, hops, yeast, and water. Malt of barley is used because it converts sugars, starches into sugars rather quickly. Now, malt of barley is simply barley seed that has been sprouted and then dried. And then the seeds are roasted to vary degrees of toastiness, as you can see. The barley offers the beer its color, its mouthfeel, and its sweetness, any sweetness that is present. Okay, start over. Okay, if you're gonna do this, when you go from one to the other, do it slowly, don't go bum, 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 bum. Okay. Da, da, okay. Da. And this way he can follow you too. <laughs> and nobody throws up in the theater. All right. The, uh, <clears throat> yeah. There were four basic ingredients in beer. First is malted barley. Then we have hops. The next is yeast. And then water. Now, malted barley is used because it converts starch into sugars rather quickly. And those sugars are necessary to produce beer. It produces both its carbonation and its alcohol. Now, malted barley is simply barley seeds that have been sprouted and then dried. And as you can see by the different colors here, they are toasted to different degrees of doneness. Different colors will impart different flavors. You can look at uh, something like this. This is a Pilsner malt. Now, this would be made 
into a light, refreshing beer. This, an amber malt, could possibly be used to make an English pale ale and offer biscuit-like qualities, maybe bread-like aromas. And something as dark roasted as this can make a stout or perhaps a uh, porter. And that could offer coffee or chocolate overtones. So the, the barley offers, as I said, the color, the mouthfeel, and the sweetness. But most beers are made from a combination of malts. If you have a dark roasted uh, beer, it's probably no more than 10 or 15% of the dark roasted malt. They use a, a combination, every recipe is a little different. Um, all right, and I'm just rambling now, so. <laughs> so that was okay. Well. We got enough, because we're also okay. okay, so should we do hops now? Yeah, yeah. We'll just keep rolling, just keep going. Okay, the second ingredient is hops. The hops are, are very fast growing. In fact, they can grow up to a foot in a day. And it's related to the cannabis family. I've uh, heard tell of people actually hopping with cannabis, not that I would condone that kind of activity. But as you can see, these are very, very dry, yet very resiny and very aromatic. Now I can tell just by the smell what type of hop this is. This happens to be a Cascade hop. It has an intense grapefruit aroma. Now brewers either use whole leaf hops or nowadays <clears throat> they use pellets. Now pellets are just these hops ground and compressed. Uh, all the big breweries use these, even uh, many of the microbreweries use these hop pellets. Uh, the hops add the bitterness to all the beers. It can add a floral quality to the nose. Um, and each hop crop is analyzed individually. And that's rated by an international bitterness unit. So if you look at a beer that has many different things written on it, such as a rogue brewery, it'll tell you the IBUs. A uh, simple beer like a Budweiser might have a 20 IBU rating, and something along the line of a rogue uh, Imperial Stout would have a, oh, maybe a 75 rating. So bitterness can really vary greatly. The bitterness is used to both balance the sweetness of all the malted barley, and it's also used as a preservative. Okay. I could pour a beer there and. Okay, cut. Okay. Save. Okay. Go to east. Okay, roll cameras. We're on. <clears throat> Rolling. Oh, there we go. Okay. <coughs> All right, take two beer ingredients. That's easy for you to say. <laughs> the third ingredient in beer is yeast. Now yeast has a surprising effect. It converts the, everyone knows, <clears throat> okay. The third ingredient in beer is yeast. Now yeast is necessary to convert the sugar into both alcohol and into carbonation. So it's very important there. What most people may not realize is the amazing effect it has on the flavor of beer. Now the yeast may impart bitterness. It can impart sourness. It can, uh, earthiness, it, yeast is very, very powerful effect. And the last ingredient is water. Now, in the old days, you could tell where a beer came from because you could taste the water. In Pilsen, they would make a Pilsner because the water was very soft. In Burton on Trent in England, they would make a, in America, and in, <clears throat> the last ingredient is water. In the old days, it had, a, a very big impact on how the beer tasted. In Pilsner, in the town of Pilsen, they made, Jesus, Pilsner is not the name of the town. The fourth ingredient is water. Before modern brewing techniques, no, that's not gonna work either. The fourth ingredient is water. Water used to determine how the beer tasted. In the town of Pilsen in the Czech Republic, they made very soft Pilsner beers because the water was very soft. In Burton and Trent in England, they made very aggressive English ales because the water had high mineral content. So you could always tell where a beer came from by the taste of the beer. The water had that much impact. Today, brewers can alt chemically alter the water. They can remove the, the minerals, they could add minerals, they can make it as soft as they need to be. So you can brew any type of beer anywhere in the world today. Rolling, 
There you are. <laughs> Beer 101, Tom Peters. Beer ingredients, take three and... The third ingredient is yeast. There are two basic types of yeast used in brewing. There is a lager yeast and there is an ale yeast. A lager yeast ferments on the bottom of the tank. The vessels are, are large vessels. On the bottom, it ferments at longer, for longer times at core temperatures. It generally results in a softer, more approachable beer. An ale yeast, on the other hand, rises to the top. It does its magic on the top of the brew kettle, on the fer fermentation, sorry. The third ingredient is yeast. There are two basic types of yeast. There is lager yeast and ale yeast. A lager yeast is used in Germany and other countries. It relies on working on the bottom of the, brew, of the fermentation vessel, and it works at a long, for a longer period of time at lower temperatures. An ale yeast works on the top. It's more aggressive, it needs a higher temperature, and the beers tend not to be as soft as Pilsner's. Now yeast is important because it does two things. It both converts the sugar into alcohol and also into carbonation. The effects of yeast on the flavor is something that most people don't realize. Many yeasts can impart a sourness, like a bretomycin strain of yeast. You could also have uh, bitterness added to it. Uh, there are many different flavors that it could add. Uh, so yeast is phenomenally important in beer. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so I didn't wrap that up well, but. Rolling, rolling. Beer 101, beer ingredients and brewing, take five. Okay, now that we know the ingredients of beer, how do we get from these ingredients to this? Well, we're gonna go up to Nodding Head Brewery and Gordon Grubb, Brewmaster Gordon Grubb, is gonna show us how beer is actually made. Oh yeah, there you go. <laughs> I can do that again with the. Do it again. Yeah. What's that? Uh, I'll be right back. Somebody's gonna have to. I might take a sip again. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I will. That's all I wanted. I got a great shot. Okay. Just, uh, well, I just wanna. Yeah, I just feel. Yeah, yeah. Okay, hold on. Hold on. Um, all right, rolling. Now that we. I'm oh, sorry. Your ingredients take five. Again. <laughs> now that we know the brewing, the beer ingredients. Now that we know the ingredients of beer, how do we get from this to this? Well, we're going to head up to Nodding Head Brew Pub, and brewmaster Gordon Grubb is going to show us the actual process of brewing beer. Cheers. Can I get you something again? Sure. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Cheers. All right, I want to get a Yeah. Just have a sip of beer. Woohoo! Sipping and eyeing. Cheers.
rolling. There are resins in hops, and as you do this, you can feel the remains on your hands. This goes into the beer. This is part of the chemical process that imparts the bitterness. And you can see, actually see the residue on my hand, the little yellowing right there, or greening, I should say. That smell goes on and on. These happen to be Cascade hops, so I'm getting a lot of grapefruit aroma out of this particular uh, hop strain. This is a relatively bitter hop used in Sierra Nevada and also in Anchor Liberty Ale and many other American style IPAs. Any other interesting anecdotes? <laughs> rating? Um, <clears throat> When's the first time you smelled hops or saw hops? Well, the first time I tasted Cascade hops was with an Anchor Liberty Ale. I'd never had anything quite so bitter before. And it turns out these are raised in the Yakima Valley, which I think they raise in the neighborhood of 80% of all the hops used in the United States in the Yakima Valley in Washington. And they grow so many different varieties of hops. There were dozens, literally dozens of different styles of hops. And they're making new hybrids all the time. Across the world, people are now coming to realize that Americans grow some of the best hops in the world. And now Belgians are starting to brew with American hops. Well. Do you remember, can you tell a story about the first time you ever tasted beer or drank beer? Uh, I was probably eight years old. <laughs> first time I tasted beer was in the, my grandfather's back porch, a Carling Black Label. I was probably in fifth grade. And I snuck a can of Carling Black Label, which was brewed in Canada back then. And I couldn't believe how good it tasted. I, I was born to drink beer. <laughs> Any good stories about the first time you got drunk? I don't remember. <laughs> <laughs> Let's see. Uh, how about the first time you brewed beer? What did it taste like? What was that experience like? My first foray into uh, brewing beer at home, I went to Home Sweet Home Brew where George and Nancy uh, at 20th and Samson gave me a, a brew kit and I went to brew a Belgian Abbey Double. So it was just simply pouring some syrup, malt syrup into a, a bucket and boiling it and doing these things. It was pretty rudimentary, but I was surprised at how well the beer, how good the beer tasted. The second time I brewed, I did it with a little bit of fresh grain in it, and that was delicious. And then the third time I tried to go all grain, except I totally ruined the, the beer. I did not extract enough of the sugars out of the grain. I didn't take my time. They told me it would take a couple of hours. I spent an hour instead of two, and uh, my beer was thin and insipid, so. I decided I don't really need to beer, brew beer anymore. I have the best beers in the world at my fingertips, so I stopped brewing beer myself. Um, All right, let me go wash my hands, because I am sticky. So you gotta get these flash, have these uh, spotlights in for cleaning. Yeah. Right, Tom, um, let me touch you right now. Okay, your shoulder is outside of my frame right now. Right? The shoulder? So okay. that's the furthest over that you should go. Okay. Now you are free to move all the way back. Okay. As far back as you want. And in fact, if you guys want to slide back a couple of inches, oh, right, 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 yeah, right in the video. That would give me a little more liberty. That's a good angle. That's nice. I like that. That's what we have done. Let's get paid better. Actually, step forward. Time to step forward a little more. Tap it on your chin. Okay, can you zoom out any further? You need to bring Fergie in. There's a little further down the bar. No, no, no. Don't zoom out. Bring Fergie a little bit further down the bar. Okay, Fergie, do you want to move in here? Ah. This is my widest angle, and I've got a slight clearance on both outside shoulders. Okay, now I'm going to have to go get beer. Okay. Um, you know. If you could reach down, is there a shelf or anything? Right there? Or I can hand it to you. All right. I'll just set up. You can sit, yeah, right there. That'd be great, because that way you won't leave the frame. Maybe my mind, but not the frame. No, no, no I need to have an order. Right. Where are you going to be pouring? In front of that tap or behind you? Um, you want it in front? 
Ideally, yeah. Okay. I mean, let's do a dry run through without cracking. Uh, yeah, don't okay. open the bottles. Well, that should just have the beer here then. Start with the first beer. Now, you, should I turn the label which way? Toward it. Yeah, this is the main camera. Right okay. Okay, now we're losing Tom. We don't have him in the frame. Yeah, I'd back up. Okay, well, this is. I can back up. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. Yeah. We need to do that in there. Order of beer, just in case you are handing me beers in. Okay. It'll be. Well, I'm doing this first. Yeah. I have the next one right here. Okay. I have the glasses. Well, yeah, and then this one. Okay. And then okay. Chimay. I'm just going to no, pour one of these because it's so forward. Okay. No. Pour two of those. Yeah. Although I could. In chair forward. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you come forward about uh, six inches. Okay. Yeah, that's good. Yeah. So we're looking into that camera. We're talking about the beer. We're gonna talk about the beer. I'll just say a little bit about the, the you know, yeah. that we have this beer commissioned for us. Uh -huh. So what I would like to do is do a run through without you cracking it. Just pretend you're doing it so that mm -hmm. you can get used to the camera. Yep. Yeah, the front of the camera yet, and you will see how it looks. Okay. Very good. Any better? Right on the uh, just hand me the clock. We saying. don't need to write what each scene is. I'll just clock. I've already written what the scene is. Okay, good. Okay. Then, then give me the marker too. I've already done it. Yeah, I know, but I'll be behind here, so I want to change it to the next one. Okay, thanks. It's gonna be a beer boy. How's the horizontal? Yeah, the horizontal on that beer bag. Is that all right? Far back. Um, Far back. You know your camera's on, Mike. Do you want it on? Mark, rolling. Wait, 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 wait. Rolling. Okay. Roll camera. Roll. Okay. Beer 101. Finished beer. Take one. And go. Okay, Fergie. We're gonna taste the Monk's Cafe Flemish Sour Ale. Now, as you recall, we had this specially brewed for us by Van Steenberg in the little town of Urtevel, just outside of Ghent in Belgium. Care to taste? Cheers. Cheers. What we're drinking is Monk's Cafe Flemish Sour Ale, which is a, a Flemish Sour Ale. <laughs> Any relationship to the Flemish Sour Ales? Yeah. It's <laughs> and uh, Monk's Cafe. Now this is a, this beer has a, been aged in oak for three years, and then it's blended with fresh beer to give it re enliven the carbonation of the beer. It already has its alcohol because it went through its primary fermentation. Now this beer, you definitely get hints of wood and sourness. There, there's a, a strain of yeast that resides in the wood called lactobacillus, and it inoculates this particular beer with a very innate sourness, very subtle. But this beer is unique in that we don't really balance it with sugar. So it's subtly sour, but there's no sweetness to this beer. And what do you what else do you get out of this beer? It has high acidity. Mm -hmm. So we can use this beer to cook with because of the high pH level. You can use it in place of uh, vinegar in recipes and for dressings. Uh, it's a great aperitif because of the high acidity level. It can cleanse your palates after having a really stinky cheese before you move from one beer to another, sort of like an intermezzo or a sorbet. It's really a, an incredibly refreshing summer hot weather beer or a great food beer. Cut. Now, I'm facing this. Yeah, you're oh, facing that. Man. He's just going to be doing pickups well, and he'll do okay. close up to the face. All right, beer 101, finish beer, take two. Now we're going to go over five of our most popular beers and our favorite beers here at Monk's. Of course, one of our favorite beers is the Monk's Cafe Flemish Sour Ale. Okay. <laughs> we'll start over. Okay. Um, I'd like to introduce my business partner. I'll just read you that. Hold on. Is that okay? Okay. Am I looking at the test camera? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Okay. All right, 
Okay. I'd like to introduce my business partner. This is Fergus Carey. Hello. He and I opened Monk's Cafe in March of 1997. Almost nine years. A long time. <laughs> and we still talk to each other. Occasionally. <laughs> now, we're, we're going to taste five of our favorite beers and most popular beers here at Monk's. The first one is a specially commissioned beer we had made in the, the brewery Van Steenberge in the little village of Erteveld, which is right outside of Ghent in Belgium. This is a style of beer that was no longer being brought into America. It's a true Flemish sour ale. Most of the ones that were being brought in had, were having extra sugar added to it, and hence the beers were no longer very sour. They were sweet, and we were looking specifically for a sour ale. Cheers, sir. Cheers. So you can look at the color. It has a little ruddy redness to it. Part of that is from the, they actually use red malt, red roasted malt to make this beer. And part of it comes from the oak that it's aged in. This is aged in oak for three years, and then it's blended with fresh, freshly brewed beer, I should say, which gives it its carbonation. The alcohol is produced during the primary fermentation. It lays there for three years in oak, and it picks up a specific yeast strain called lactobacillus that resides in the grains of wood, gives it this sourness to the beer. It's quite acidic. The high pH level is, is the acidity, and that gives it its versatility. You can use this beer to cook with. It's very good to marinate meats. Uh, it's also, you can replace vinegar uh, in a recipe with this beer. That's how acidic this beer is, the high level of pH it has. It's also very, very refreshing. It's, uh well, it's great on a summer day or a cold winter night. <laughs> Hot oh. summer day, it's a great thirst quencher. Absolutely, absolutely. absolutely. Yeah. But it's also a great intermezzo. It'll be a, a palate cleanser. If you've had a nice, stinky, funky, earthy cheese and you feel like you need to shave your tongue to get it off, you can use this beer instead. It's also good for a nightcap. <laughs> Don't wear it, though. <laughs> okay. Cut. Enough, enough for that beer? Rolling, rolling. <laughs> All right, beer 101, finished beer, take three. All right, now we're going to go to the first Belgian beer I ever tasted, Duvel. This holds a special place in my heart. It's still one of my all-time favorite beers. Now, this beer is tricky to pour. You have to get, it's very carbonated. You have to get just enough head in there and see if I get this correct. Now the beer is pouring clear. Voila. A little bit too much. Ed. Let me try with that one's for you, Fergie. You're always better <laughs> at pouring your own time. Absolutely. Now the idea is that you don't get the yeast into the glass of the It's a bottle conditioned beer. You want to try to decant the beer so that you pour a nice clear beer and save the yeast for the end. Now the perfect pour of a doable will be like this, where you're just cutting through the glass, the Dubal name on the glass with the head and the, and the beer. Now you look at this massive head and see how turbidly active this yeast is. You can see the yeast, the carbonation just flowing up from the bottom of this beer. This head will last for hours, literally. But I think it's time to stop oh, talking okay. about it and drink it. Cheers. Cheers. Now the first thing I get out of it is the hops. It's a very, very hoppy beer. This has, uh, they use Styrian Goldings in this beer, and it has almost a black pepper, crushed black pepper aroma. And also, if you look at it, it looks light and fluffy, and uh, Michael Jackson uh, referred to this as the most beguiling beer. Like, he it, definitely he thinks it's deceptive. You look at this and you think of a, a light, fluffy beer, but it's a, it's called Duval for a reason. It'll... Devilishly strong. Yeah, it will kick you. It's, uh, the, the head is thick and froth, frothy, but as you can see by the design of the glass, you can turn this glass, even though the head is massive, and the beer comes right up to the lip. It's an incredibly well-designed glass pairing with the beer. Now, the, part of the reason it has so much carbonation coming up, releasing in the bottom, is that they have an etching of a fleur-de-lis at the base of the inside of the glass, and that creates surface tension, and it constantly is crushing these bubbles and releasing the CO2 that's in there. This beer is crisp, it's refreshing, it tastes unlike 
an American Pilsner or a Heineken, although it does resemble it in the pale, pale color it has. The important thing to remember, this is 8.5% alcohol. This so is not a session beer. This <laughs> is a... Unless you're in Belgium. One or two of these, and uh, that may be enough. It's still, it's one of my all-time favorite beers. Don't try this at home. <laughs> okay. Next. Okay. All right. How was that? Yeah, well, uh, on your list. All right. It's Good. a beer show. Finished That's beer. <laughs> beer 101, five. All right. Now we're going to taste Clack. And this is a, I love the glass for this beer. This is called a foot glass. Very similar to the yard glass that they use in England. Uh, of course, you have to be very. Oops, the glass is slipping. Right, let me do that again. Sorry. All right, just keep keep rolling. Well, I need to get another bottle of beer. Okay, cut. Sorry, the glass actually is slipping out of my. Hand. One. <coughs> and uh, take five. Finish beer again, and it'll kill you for confident in the crack the thing. Okay. All right, now we're going to drink a beer called Quack. This is a strong ale. Runs about 8%. And this glass is called a stirrup glass. And the reason they call that is when the horsemen would company, company the royalty. The beer's flat. <laughs> God damn it. That's flat. It's supposed to be that way? Yeah, it yeah. should feel the whole. Yeah. Okay, cut. Hold on. <clears throat> beer 101, finished beer, take six. Okay, Fergie, now I'm going to give you a quack. I shall accept. Yeah, you shall. This is a strong brown ale. Runs in the neighborhood of 8.5% uh, also. Now, this is, I'm pouring into what the, is called a stirrup glass. And it's called that for a reason. The beer, uh, the horsemen that used to accompany the royalty used to uh, have to stay outside of the inn while the, the the gentry was inside dining and, and uh, drinking. And of course they sent out a beer to the, the soldiers and they'd had to stay on their horses. Well with this glass, the soldiers could drink their beer and then they could store the beer in the stirrup uh -huh. of the saddle. So have a sip of this beer. Yeah, sure. You can drink it right inside. You can hold it by the handle. Hold it by the handle? Yeah, and just uh -huh. have a sip. So very, this is the first Belgian beer available on draft in America. And uh, I made the arrangements for that probably 12 years ago or so. So uh, when I was at another restaurant called Copa 2, we were the first bar in America to have a Belgian beer on draft, and it was quack. I had to agree to buy an entire pallet along with keep paying the price of the empty keg uh, to get this beer in. Well worth it. It's a delicious beer. I licorice. I always had licorice right off the top with this beer. Absolutely. And they actually use licorice root in this beer uh -huh. to brew this beer. Now uh, with the Guinness, you get a little licorice and that's from the, the black patent malt that they put into the beer. Uh -huh. With this they actually put a little bit of licorice root in, in the final boil of the uh, uh -huh. of the beer. Very strong, very beautiful, really easy to drink. I'd say. That's right. <laughs> Perhaps I'll have a taste. Yeah, have a taste. Uh, I'll have very malty, almost fruit-like malt in that beer. It's a beautiful color, too. It's uh, definitely an amber ale. It goes great with rabbit, um, especially rabbit terrine. Mm -hmm. um, it's very good to cook with pork. It's a very food-friendly beer, as are most beers that are brewed in Belgium. They're very food-centric beers in Belgium. Oh. That's, just That's also very refreshing. <laughs> Absolutely. All right, cut. Rolling. Okay. Finish beer 101, take seven. Now, you and I visited this monastery, Fergie. This is the monastery of Chimay in Scormont in Belgium. It's really close to the French border. Now, this is a Trappist ale. This is brewed in a Trappist monastery. And there are only six breweries that can use that nomenclature of being a Trappist ale. On the cork, the date of bottling is always on there. This one was brewed, was bottled in December of 2005. So it's a very young beer. 
it's really e easy to drink now, but if you cellar it, it can really evolve into a more complex beer. Pour the beer down the side a little bit, down to the center. You have to have enough head in there to release the flavors and aromas. This is a beautiful beer. This is one of the most well-known Belgian beers in America. Um, this is their Grand Reserve. This was the second beer they brewed. The first one was the Premier, hence the name Premier. This Grand Reserve, this was made uh, as an anniversary, um, I think 300th year that they made this beer. Uh, 300th anniversary of the Scormont Abbey. And it used to be brewed by a gentleman named Father Theodore. He has since passed away, and he's buried on the grounds of Scormont. This is a, here, cheers. Cheers. Look at the color of that. Nice, deep, almost mahogany color. Oh, Beautiful, a, lacy head. This is rich and malty. It's, mm. it, it gives me a lovely warm feeling inside. The mother's milk of beer here. <laughs> it's good for you. I, I get a lot of botanicals out of it, lots of spice. I've never been able to quite pin down what they are. I've been through the brewery numerous times, but they literally have a locked door where you cannot go in where they hide the, the spices. So I've never been able to get that out of any of those. The monks take a vow of celibacy and silence. Um, so they have nothing else to do but drink beer. Uh, monks Cafe pours the Chimay White on tap, and we were the first, uh, first bar outside of Belgium to have Chimay White on tap. Uh, Tom and I went over and uh, <laughs> met with the export manager who tried to poison us, but uh, we, we lived through to tell the tale. And, uh, he laid down the gauntlet for us. He wanted to, uh, he said we'd take it out to lunch and we'd discuss the possibility of us having this beer available on draft in Philadelphia, in America. And we hop in the car and he says, you know, I'm going to take you to a place that no Americans like. And we thought, geez, thanks a lot. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Michelle. And the Americans uh, don't like it because it's all uh, organ meats, a lot of organ meats on the menu. But uh, we managed to, uh, we well, have sweetbreads and kidneys <laughs> and veal brain. They, uh, I, he was, we were ordering a meal. He asked if we liked uh, these items and kidneys we liked, sweetbreads we liked. And then I heard him order what I thought was veal brain. I said, did you just order calf brain? And he said, yes. Would you like it hot or cold? And I said, I probably hot. So it came out on a plate. It looked like a creme brulee with the spoon and you cracked the skin onto it. And you it was caramelized it. on top. You would crack the skin and you skipped in, scooped into this creamy center. And we had several bites of this. Mm -hmm. Wasn't bad, wasn't great. Didn't uh -huh. really need to have any more. But we had just enough for them to uh -huh. think, OK, yeah. these guys can have the Chimay on but draft. The, but the big fear of uh, putting Chimay white on tap in America is that they, they uh, w it wouldn't get treated properly. It wouldn't be uh, poured properly. It wouldn't be cellared properly. It wouldn't be loved properly. I think they realized after our lunch that we would love that beer properly. <laughs> or take advantage of that beer. Uh, hey. That's one way of saying it. Now this beer has so many different flavor components. Um, I've heard somebody mention that it tastes a little bit like root beer. Had that little bit of bark mm -hmm. taste to it. And you can really get a, just a hint of that underneath. Very malty. This is a great beer for a steak. Great beer with uh, stinky cheese. It's, ooh, it's a big, bold beer. This would be uh, uh, like a, a nice red burgundy, if to equate that to uh, wine. And lots of layers of flavor, lots of subtleties, but very bold and robust. It's really a, you can s sit in front of a fireplace on a snowy day and, and drink this beer. It's when, really wonderful. When, uh, when tasting beers with friends or educating uh, beers uh, with friends, uh, I, you should uh, keep quiet until everybody has tasted the beer. Like just uh, now, like t when, as soon as Tom said uh, root beer, I said, oh yeah, I can get root beer. <laughs> so you don't want to be suggesting too many things. Like, oh, yes, you do. <laughs> well, I, but I, let, like, I think let the people taste the first and then let Absolutely. Them, uh, and you're like, oh, bananas. Oh, yeah. <laughs> you're bananas. I am bananas. Yes. Loving you just makes me bananas. So this is one of the finest beers brewed in Belgium, one of the six Trappist monasteries available from the world. And uh, we carry all the beers from uh, Chimay. All right. Got Cheers. Uh, rolling. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> what are we shooting here? Oh, beer 101, Finnish beer, uh, C8. What you got for me now, Tom? It's time for dessert. Uh -huh. 
this is a, a, a lambic beer, which is totally different than beers we talked about before. Previously, we discussed ales and lagers, and which were different types of yeast strain. This is one that's brewed with ambient yeast. They actually let the beer sit in a cool temperature to cool down, I'd say at an average temperature to cool down, and the yeast in the air inoculates this beer and, oh. and creates the alcohol and carbonation. So this is nature's own beer. This one truly magic happens with. Now is this uh, is, uh, the fermentation specific to this area? Of Belgium, it's a or? very small area, I'd say probably about 15 square miles where this uh, flora exists in the air, flora and fauna. It's just it's very site specific um, along the Seine River, S-E-N-N-E -N -N -E River. Um, one of the, the most traditional breweries is in the south of Brussels called Cantillon, mm -hmm. and they make very, very sour ales. Uh, this is one of the most commercially uh, viable beers. This is uh, Lindemann's, and Lindemann's... Look at that color. Yeah, this is a raspberry infused beer. So they, this is made with 60% wheat and 40% malted barley. And they use hops in this beer, but they use hops strictly as a preservative. The hops are aged for two years before they're added to the beer. So they lose almost all their bittering qualities. Previously, we, we showed the resin that was in the, the oils that were in the hops. Those oils dry up, and that's the bittering part of the, uh, of the hop. This just uses it strictly for preservative uh, values. I've had lambics that are 30 years old and that were absolutely amazing, just phenomenally well preserved. This is one of the more commercially viable ones, as I said. You can see the color of this, lots of raspberry in there. I think perhaps they used even a little bit of raspberry syrup. But as soon as I opened the bottle, what did you smell? <laughs> Raspberries, funnily enough. <laughs> you can smell it from yes. across the room. But I know immediately, I could sit in my office. 20 feet away from here, and I know when somebody's drinking one of these, I can smell it when it's opened. Very aggressively uh, fruited. He's like that with food, too. <laughs> raspberry, raspberry, raspberry. With a little bit of tartness in the back. Mm -hmm. um, more than just a raspberry tartness. This is from the uh, yeast strains that are in, uh, inherent in this area. So that if we try to brew openly here, like there would be no yeast in the air to... Uh, it would be school kill punch, probably. <laughs> okay. <laughs> probably not very tasty. And too much pollution in the air here. Uh, and this area is just uh, outside, or just around Brussels? It's the in the southern region. part of Brussels, to the southwest of Brussels. is a very small area. There are perhaps um, two handfuls of brewers, uh, maybe eight or nine brewers that d still do traditional Lambic beers. Again, Cantillon is the most traditional of them, but very tart, very acidic, very sour. Um, some, for some people, very unapproachable. But for people who like very oaky uh, beers, like Chardonnays, California Chardonnays, they tend to really like the Cantillons. This is very mass marketed, very easy to drink. I like this beer, and I'm a beer geek. People who don't like beer at all are always blown away by this beer. Uh, this is a good beer to bring people into beer world. When I'm, um, when I'm talking to all our Irish people about beer, they have this uh, said like that. They think that uh, a beer is uh, just all one type of pale lager. And then they say, oh, well, I've, I've got a beer for you. And I'm going to the Chimay Grand Reserve or, or this. And it's like, oh, you don't like beer? And then come, uh, my aunt and uncle were here. And we sat down at uh, the table up front at Monk's. And we uh, we got a bottle of Chimay Grand Reserve and a bottle of Lindemann's from Bar. And they, uh, my aunt, who was totally uh, not into beer, didn't want beer. And a few minutes later, she was like, can we get this in Galway? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this is uh, this is closely related to the original beers that the Sumerians would have made mm -hmm. because it's spontaneously fermented. It's from the ambient yeast. Back then, they wouldn't have had beakers of yeast like we showed earlier. Mm -hmm. um, it would have just been the spontaneous fermentation that caused the magic, which is why they always thought the the people who brewed were witches or priestess. Um, and this is the magic is still happening in Belgium, and it's. It's uniquely uh, brewed beer, and it, this goes back to the original style. Not all lambics are fruited. There was, there's a straight lambic called uh, Goose, which is just a blend of a three-year-old lambic with a freshly brewed lambic, which gives it recarbonation. Um, 
and these beers are spectacular. Now, what's the alcohol level in this one? <laughs> well, since they're spontaneously fermented, they don't have as much control over the, the alcohol content. They probably range between five and a half to six and a half percent, so they're very quaffable. Quite, quite light for Belgian. Really. For Belgian ales, we're quite light. For American beers, pretty strong. Mm -hmm. But this is great with a bittersweet chocolate cake mm -hmm. or uh, even raspberries, vanilla ice cream. This is just really good. Some people use it as an aperitif, but I think it's a little bit too sweet for that. All right. You can wrap it up and set it Okay. Would you care for a little more? Sure. <laughs> more dessert. So we have uh, many styles of beers here. We just touched on a few of them. Uh, in, in future uh, classes, we'll go over many different styles. There are more than 50 styles of beer. We just touched on a couple of them today. So I uh, hope you come back and uh, we'll show you some more styles. Cheers. Cheers. Just get you taking a couple of sips and going, ah. Uh. Oh. Ah. Uh. And again. Oh, baby. Very good. I've been tasting this all week. Yeah, go ahead whenever you're ready. For the ladies. <laughs> Very good. I am the Will Rogers of beer. Sam, did you want to Never met a beer a I didn't sniffer. like. Brandy Snifter from uh, Jody. Thank you. I don't seem to have one here. And then he's got to do with the Shemaya. Oh, oh, excellent, excellent. It's looking great. Oh, well, you got to drink more. Yeah, I'm sorry Jesus. about this. <laughs> I to, actually, today was my first day. It was going to be a sobriety until I went to Belgium. <laughs> well, seriously. <laughs> Are you ready? It's good to keep in training. Now I gotta call. I'm, I'm, I'm a limpian at this stage. <laughs> oh my gosh. I love this beer. My best friend. Hey. Should we uh, bring up one of the old uh, Chimais and we're gonna talk about how this beer can evolve? Mm. Um, when to drink a beer, yeah. Right. And, you know, Gordon and the same, you know, his, his beer's keeper, it's never an issue because it always got in a couple of weeks. Right. Yeah, let me go downstairs and get one of the aged ones. I do have, uh, I forget how old I've they are. I've got a buzz. Yeah. Wow. Rolling. That's and one of them. All right, and rolling. Beer 101, serving beer. Take one. Now that Gordon's shown us the brewing process, I'd like to introduce you to my business partner, Fergus Carey. Hello. Fergie, they call me. Oh, among other things. <laughs> Go on. Now, the question that people ask me most is, when is a beer ready to drink? Generally, you want to drink it within three months of it brew, the brew date, um, or it'll start losing some of its freshness and some of its characteristics. Some beers, such as a Thomas Hardy Ale, require extensive aging. Now this is very young, this is only two years old, and we're going to taste this beer. Now notice the glass I'm, I've chosen for this. This is a snifter. This is a big multi beer requiring a lot of air to get into it to open up. This is a barley wine. This is an English barley wine. Small bottle, big beer. First you want to look at the color. This is really a nice, rich mahogany color. You want to look at the head. Now this is a very loosely carbonated beer because of so much malt, the, mo the CO2 molecules have a difficult time escaping. It's a very viscous beer. You get the aroma, there, mm. is, there are tons of malt put in here. It's just amazingly rich and malty, fruity, estery, Smells like dried figs, dates, plums. It's really an incredibly rich beer, very warming. We serve this at cellar temperature. This should not be chilled any below uh, 50 degrees, 55 degrees Fahrenheit. Nope. It could even be consumed at uh, room temperature, actually. Now, why do they call it a barley wine when it's actually a beer? 
Well, because of the high alcohol content approach that of wine, ah. but it's made with barley, malt of barley, so they de decided that they needed to call it a barley wine. Okay. And that's an English style, English origin. Mm. Wow, the taste is phenomenal. Almost like burnt caramel. Now you can use your tongue. Well, another way to use your tongue is to feel, the, to get the mouth feel. And here you use your tongue as a scale. You let it lay on your tongue. A soft Pilsner will be very light. A beer like a Thomas Hardy barley wine will be very heavy. There's a lot of residual sugar left in that. Same volume of liquid, it'll be literally physically heavier. Also really touch your tongue. And it's a very long finish on this beer. You can, what, what's the last flavor you taste out of this beer, Fergie? Mmm. Mmm. That's a good flavor. Right? Yeah, um, <laughs> sweet, something very sweet caramel. Uh, I get lots of caramel out of it also. Very sweet. Now this will dry over the years. Now I've had Thomas Hardy ales uh, dating back, actually the oldest one I've had was 1968, which is the first year they brewed this. And I had that two years ago. And so it was over 40 years old. And it was liquid ambrosia. I've tasted nothing like it before in my life. So this beer you can drink now, but it's really a waste of what it's what the potential of the beer. It's like drinking a uh, a '97 Cabernet uh, from California in 1999 when they first release it. That wine needs to sit down for so long.
important aspect of brewing. So use your entire tongue. Really think about where you're tasting on your tongue, what things are being stimulated. That'll tell you some of the characteristics of the beer. This is not sweet at all now. This is much sweeter. I get much more sweetness on the front of my tongue. And it's great to share, get together with a bunch of friends, choose a lot of different beers, or choose one style of beer. Perhaps get all the German Hefeweizens together, or all the Belton Trappist sales together, and sit there and pop open bottles and share them with four or five friends and discuss the differences between them. It could make for a very interesting evening. Educational evening. Yes. <laughs> and fun. All right. Mm. Cut. Uh, that has the uh, like one stage had uh, like 800 breweries and uh, uh, 500 breweries and 800 different types of beer and uh, well, we could do. I love and that. Uh, just yeah. uh, the, and you know the like uh, me if I'm but wrong but it's like the you guys discussing you know monks and how it, you know how much you love Belgian beer and why it's different you guys can do go back and forth on the food just we can record that segment we got the time we got 10 minutes right yeah yeah I think okay. that's a good idea. Okay. Uh, roll camera, Fergie and Tom discussing monks, Belgian Disgu beer, and life in general. Tom and Fergie disgusting. Disgusting. <laughs> Actually <laughs> disgusting. Oh. So the, well, why, why Belgium? Why is Belgium uh, like such the, the beer heaven, essentially? The beer paradise, I think they call it themselves. Oh, yeah. For me, it's the epicenter of beer. It's. Uh, over the years, they were overrun by so many different cultures, and they had so many different influences on their cuisine and, and uh, beverages. Um, part of the reason they specialize in beer is because they're above the grape line. No grapes really grow well uh, in, in Belgium or else. That's why they don't really make any wine. <clears throat> they also were a center of the spice trade for centuries. So every exotic spice that came from the Middle East or anywhere in the world came through Bruges or Brussels. There were lots of rivers running through Brussels at one time. And uh, they, they were able to grab different spices and they have no boundaries on what they can do for beer. As opposed to Germany, when they, they have this law called the Reinhardtsgebot, which was something happened in the 1400s to ensure the purity of beer in Germany. And that dictated that you could only use four ingredients in beer. You could use malted barley, hops, yeast, and water, and that was it. Except for a special dispensation in Bavaria where they could use some wheat in the beer because the farmers grew wheat there, so they allowed them to do that. In Belgium, it was anything you wanted to throw into beer, you could. And it, it had just evolved through the culture that they actually built a, a cuisine around beer. They have cuisine a la beer. So you can go into a three Michelin star restaurant and they're going to feature beer as prominently as they do wine in their mm -hmm. cuisine or a corner cafe. And it's it's really a, a magical place. It really is beer paradise. Now, I, I also heard that there was a, a restriction on, the, the, on hard liquor, so that they couldn't have hard liquor. They, they couldn't, they didn't have grapes for wine, so therefore they brewed a strong, what they could do, they could be, uh, brew beer, and they brewed as strong a beer as they could, and as like as flavorful and as... Uh, it was, a, it was a tax on the uh, liquor. It was a tax that made it pr prohibitively expensive. Um, so that's that's why you have Genevers, which are low on, lower in alcohol, that people can drink a gin-type product with a low alcohol. So it's based upon alcoholic content, the tax. And, and yet the beers just became like, like these totally beautiful, colorful, complex. Well, uh, you also have uh, unique individuals. You'll have somebody like uh, <coughs> Jean-Louis Dietz, who used to be a school teacher. He's about four foot eleven, wears a leather uh, apron and he brews in a steam brewery. He's the only brewer left in Belgium that brews 100% by steam. And what brewery is that? Uh, Brasserie Vapor. Yeah, uh, yeah. he, he makes some incredibly steam beers. And steam but brewery. It's yeah. a steam brewery, yeah. but they're not obsessed with consistency. Mm -hmm. they, they brew for a harmonious flavor. Mm -hmm. So from batch to batch, you can have a totally different beer, it's, it's like Vapor. Okay. You can have the Saison Pipe from uh, Vapor. It'll taste one way, one time, the next batch will taste totally different. Because he could sources his ingredients from different people. Okay. And he's not obsessed with having the beer taste exactly the same. He's obsessed with making the beer taste good each batch. Okay. And that's totally different than American marketing, sure. where they want the same blandness throughout the line. 
and those brewers were Budweiser and Coors are amazing brewers that they can brew a consistently bland product. That's really hard to do, to take all the flavor out of beer, but they do it. <laughs> <laughs> now, Belgium is the size of Maryland, has about 10 million people, and at one time they had 500 breweries with hundreds of beers being brewed there, probably 800 beers being brewed there. Now they're in the neighborhood of 250 breweries. Lots of them were gobbled up by the bigger corporations. <laughs> Now there's a resurgence of microbreweries in Belgium. And these, you thought the beers were wacky before. Taste some of the new ones. They're off the chart crazy and delicious. So that even like uh, like uh, brewers like Deschouf, they then they have this once-off uh, brew like on Nomad that they uh, and it's like oh well this this is a batch it's a great beer it's strong it's a nine and a half percent but like we're never going to get that again it's just a once-off like an experiment from the from the brewer and yet they they throw it out there and this is like I don't know when you're thinking of big American uh, breweries like they they're not doing stuff like that at all it's more like being a chef doing today's special. Yeah, today's yeah. special we're going to have uh, salmon cooked in Lindemann's Ramboise, a little bit of cream and craft white peppercorns. Uh, there they do the same thing with sure. beers. Like, hey, you know what, I feel like making this beer today and I may never make it again. It's just a, they call it a one-off, sure. a one-time uh, beer. Uh, well, as I'm saying that too, <laughs> like comparing uh, Belgian uh, breweries to like the, the top five uh, American or the top three American, but then uh, I think, well, there's all the, the micro brewers here who like the, the um, Cal Gion from Dogfish Head. And the I think Phil he was Markowski. born in Belgium. He just doesn't know it. <laughs> and the Phil Markowski from Southampton uh, Brew Works. Uh, and it's like, yeah, yeah they're doing like you know, once off batches and goofy things and very much have the same spirit that like the Belgian brewers have. They do it on a little bit smaller scale than they do in Belgium. In Belgium, they do more breweries do it, but there are people with the soul of uh, Belgian brewers in their hearts, and uh, Sam Calcione is definitely one of those in America. Uh -huh. um, Can we give them back to Belgium? <laughs> <laughs> Not everything works, but sometimes they do. Um, All righty. All right. Cool. Fantastic. Just All as right. my.
Oh. Why is it recording? You're in a uh, like a sports environment. Uh, almost the camera does a really good job of modulating this. Oh, Scott. Okay. Okay. Notice also that that now that this camera is rolling, it has a uh, a tally light in the front. You see the red light? Mm -hmm. so there's a tally light in the front that tells you that you're recording, but also tells that the person in front of the camera that they're recording. So if you're doing documentary, you would turn your tally light off so that they don't know when it's running or not running. Uh, <laughs> Soon to be in the city. And keep okay, it so that's, that's, a, that's a guarantee that we're recording. Is that too loud? It just sounds horrible. It just sounds, it sounds I think crappy. It's 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 crappy. Crappy. That's crappy. Uh, that's a great idea. Weekend. It's <laughs> right. Yeah, left, the, hey, Brian, the left side of the camera. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Now, the, there's a VU meter for each channel. And the way a VU or volume unit meter works is that we want it to come up to zero dB between minus six and zero dB. We don't want the volume level to pin up all the way and stay up. That would be like if I moved in real close to this microphone and I pin that like that, then I'm getting a peaking light. There's a little red peak light above the VU meter. If that sound level goes up, watch, a, watch your camera. You can see there should be a peaking mm -hmm. light above it. Yeah. Maybe there's a switch where you can turn a peak light off and on. I'm looking for it. The pink light is just, it's above it in the gray area. Okay. Uh, uh, yeah. Yeah. Now, we'll try it again, John. Okay, let's see. Uh, peak, 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 peak. Are we getting it? No? no. Uh, see if there's a switch that turns your peak light off or not. All right, I'm looking. Oh, um, mine's are, the record that was on, all there. All up. It's on auto, so it's not. It's, it, it won't peak. It won't peak. Yeah. Right. So make sure that yeah, look yeah, at yeah, look at your view. Yeah. You're peaking now, but okay. So so what auto what auto does is it's going to make sure that it doesn't over modulate. Right, that yeah. it's not going to overdrive the game. It filtered. Yeah. They yeah. So now here here's one trick that a, a pro would do if if you had uh, one microphone. Uh, like a handheld and you had the on-camera microphone then what you might do is set instead of for stereo since they're both mono microphones you would set one for manual control so that you can ride the gain and get the best sound possible and set the other one for auto so in case you screw it up you've got the other auto which generally is not the why is auto not the best because auto is always trying to make everything loud or soft sound okay right. which means that when you have soft sounds the the camera raises the gain of the audio and also the room tone right so if the room tone goes up and then the room tone goes down and the room tone goes up that kind of is, is, sounds like a rushing sound on the back background so so auto sound recording is generally not the best but manual while in addition to this uh, after we finish that uh, we Ow! turn it off before you put it in there yeah. Okay. That's nice. Ow. So anyway, are you here? She's not in the shot. Matt, get into the shot, man. She's irrelevant. No, she's irrelevant. My bad, Dr. It's all about the orange shirt. Come on. It's all about the orange shirt. There you go. There you go. No, because one of them won't show her tattoo and it's on her stomach. We want, we want some, some of us um, want some of the white tone in the background, too, man. Oh. Uh -huh. <laughs> All right, I'm just going to zoom in on your nose. God. <laughs> God. <laughs> 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 I love you. All right, guys, come on, let's get to work. <laughs> zoom. <coughs> you, you can turn it on now, but... Hey, how can I give it all these... What is the display button? These numbers are driving me crazy. What do you? What? Oh wait, we're supposed to gate these, right? Hold on, right. wait, wait. First, wait, we want wait. a right, look of despair. Guys, okay? Can we get a look Relax. of despair, ladies? <laughs> that's it, right there. What about you? All right, that's that was good. good. That was wait, good. Wait. Give me, give me yeah, a slate. Yeah. Give me a slate. What that link card? Not yet. Did you see? Did you said give me a slate, right? That's enough slate. <laughs> All right, it, look, it just looks off. Yeah, and I got a, uh, uh, and, and uh, the that, shot that microphone look. is like, like you just want a lot of recording that camera on the wall. <laughs> 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 We're not actresses. Yeah.
Shoulder and holding it? Well, over the shoulder sometimes, but over it, it might be over the yeah, person yeah. or it might be coming in from underneath. Well, well how can I tell what you're focusing on? What you think you're focusing on? The, the phone? No. No? No. Just zoom in, focus, <laughs> zoom out. Oh, dang, you no. definitely wasn't focusing on the phone, bro. Oh, really, I was. It wasn't, there was a phone. Bro. But there was this phone. I know what you're there for, but there was a phone. Come on, he was. I was watching. <laughs> <laughs> no, seriously, it's, it's focused in the camera. Don't be picking on Heidi because when she gets up from that chair, she's going to kick your ass. <laughs> I was trying to say your name because she's on the tape. Look, you should just I, use a natural to check. Is it plenty? Heidi, just so you know, the huh? first couple plenty? minutes of this was not. Is it plenty? <laughs> <laughs> Have we recorded enough yet? And what's that supposed uh, to mean? I don't know what anything? Christmas is filming. That's what I'm saying. What are you supposed to do? I'm playing Christmas. Why is it two women sitting in front of me? Is your camera? I don't mind. Is my camera? Let them do all the work, slaves. I get it. Well, when you look through there, the, the horizontal and vertical lines in the in the scene that you're looking at do you, look, uh, look funky. Funky. You know a song or anything? Look funky? Yeah. How about in the like camera? No. Song, maybe? Uh, yeah, you look crooked from uh, wherever I can get it. Nine blondes yeah. over here. Yeah. Yeah. It's vibrant, full energy. It is. No, all the blondes on this side. Though. Yeah, basically. Uh -huh. Take your second favorite. Right. Um, black. Black? Uh huh. Any reason? <laughs> all right, there we go. <laughs> Wait, is she going to have to ask him questions? Yeah, I'm getting interviewed. Unless well, I thought it was though. black. Black. Yeah. Okay, uh, are the tally lights on all three cameras? Yes. Yeah. So we're recording? Yeah. This whole thing's been recorded? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Just because, no, okay. maybe it is. <laughs> the, the completely not professional recording. Well, they're completely not ready to start, apparently. But, uh, <laughs> what about who was I'm good now? Well, I mean, the, nobody's uh, directing. Oh, uh, we're supposed to be, we did yeah. correct. We got okay. slates okay. and everything. Yeah. You got a slate on everybody? Yeah. Everybody got a slate on that shot? Yeah. Uh, my other shot? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah. Room, yeah, my feeling is coming. I can't worry. Yeah. Drew, you might, your best bet might be to go under. Yeah, right. you're right. You what? Sorry, let me go under. Is that better? Yeah. 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 Andrew. Yeah. Yeah. Can you hear better? Uh, Drew, 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 down. 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 Drew, I'm at a wide angle, that's what I'm saying. I got the wide angle. Well, coming from the top is definitely better sound in general. Well, in this room, because we have the hiss coming from the air conditioning, coming from the top is better, right? Yeah. Otherwise, you're pointing up at the, at the hiss. At the hiss. Good right. job. Thank Call you. Thanks, look, crew. Look, you look guys look are good. In and out. On the screen and you look so cool in my movie. Wait, yeah. Yes. No, it's more cool. It's out of focus yeah, what we what all we're looking for right now is focus and zoom. Oh shit. And then as soon as you have your shot on Heidi. What happened? As soon as you have your shot on Heidi and you hold it for ten or fifteen seconds, pan left to Natalie. So zoom and give me ten or fifteen on seconds on Natalie. A little more, a little bit. Okay. Let's see how long it takes to pan three feet and focus. Am I slating this? No. <laughs> I might want to keep your head still or something. <laughs> Yo, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Oh, wow. Emma? Yeah. Did you okay. set that after Damon? Oh, wow, no. Yeah. All right, I'm good. You said 15 seconds, right? Yeah, yeah. 10 15 seconds. Then, then stop your camera. Okay.
Oh, 
Here you go. Here you go. Do my hoop. Oh. <laughs> Thanks. I'm gonna set up sale. I hate doing it. Oh, there you go. <laughs> he just did something. I took the, um, the red light.